today we are here to attend the talk by Gilson Wirt. So Gilson Wirt uh, received the background in electrical engineering and the master's degree from the uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, in 90 and 94, respectively. In 99, he received the doctor engineer degree in electrical engineering from the University of Dortmund in Germany. He's currently a professor at the electrical engineering department at uh, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul uh, since 2007. From July 22 uh, and December 26, 2000, 2002 and 2000, December 2006, he was professor and head of the computer engineering department at the University of the State of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, his current research work focuses on modeling and electrical stimulation of charge trap in the context of bias temperature instability, BTI, low frequency noise, uh, and hot carrier degradation. He has also worked on ionizing radiation effects, uh, TID and uh, SCT and SU on semiconductor devices. He focuses on collaborative work with academia and industry. He has established successful collaborations work with different companies and research groups in Europe, North and South America, and uh, China. So, uh, Jusu, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, the floor is with you to start uh, your talk. So, thank all the you. questions that uh, you would like to, to, to do to Jusu, you can write in the comment uh, window of uh, the YouTube. Uh, and then uh, the questions will be read to Gilson at the end of his talk. So, Gilson, the floor is, is with you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ricardo Reis. Thank you for your great work that you do in behalf of CAS and all the, the, co the colleagues that uh, do a great work uh, for the uh, circuits, and systems, uh, circuits and Systems Society chapter to be so active. Uh, congratulations for that. Well, uh, today I will try to give you a, say, say a basic understanding, a basic overview of charge trapping, trapping and how it produces noise both in time and frequency domain and also aging or bias temperature instability. Well, uh, first let's talk a little bit about the relevance of uh, charge trapping, of uh, defects, let's say so, uh, in the interface between semiconductor and dielectrics. Uh, as you know, uh, the field effect transistor, it was first proposed in the 20s, like uh, 100 years ago. But it was, it was very difficult to implement the idea what uh, the uh, Lilienfeld, what was the first one to devise, to propose this kind of device to implement this. And one of the major reasons was charge trapping. There were so many defects in the, interf in the interface between the semiconductor and the, and the dielectric uh, that uh, it was not possible to make a device that did work at that time. It took decades, almost four decades, almost 40 years to be able to make uh, a clean semiconductor and good dielectric and a clean, good enough uh, interface uh, because of you know, it was needed that the passivation technology be developed to allow the fabrication of the first working usable uh, MOSFETs. And at that time, it was not silicon, it was uh, other materials that have been used, it was not other also silicon dioxide. So I would remember that besides the semiconductors, also very important to have a very good iso isolator, a very good dielectric, such as the silicon dioxide. And today we have the half oxide and other ones. So it's very, very important to have this good material, quality materials. And in the early days, you know, you had a uh, planner device that you had the, the, the source and drain and the gate that controls the flow of charge. Now you have, the, nowadays, after that you had the fin fat, and now you have the nano sheet. 
But in all this device, the basic principle is also the same. The basic principle of operation is the, is the field effect. And also, you still have these defects, these charge traps. And actually, if you go from the good old silicon dioxide to novel materials like high K materials, the amount of defects increases. So this has always been a problem. So the quality of the uh, silicon dioxide, excuse me, the quality of the dielectric and the interface to the semiconductor. And this is seen not only in uh, uh, silicon devices, but also in 3.5 devices like gallium nitride and so on, and novel devices like uh, hexagonal boron nitride used, for instance, for uh, RIRAM, is seen also in bipolar transistors, in resistors, and so on. So this is a, a issue, I'd say so, not only for uh, the MOSFETs based on silicon materials, but also based on uh, other materials. So it's very important to understand uh, to, to understand how this charge trapping behaves at the microscopic level, would we'll say, so that you can do a, physical, a, a physically based model. And besides helping uh, circuit designs to cope with that, to make a design that works despite these defects, it's also very important to help materials and device engineers and device engineers to understand the impact and possible solutions in device engineering on how to produce better devices. Well, first I will uh, present our modeling approach. Then I will present charge trapping both time and frequency domain. I think this is, in my opinion, quite important. It's quite a, it says one of the, say of the contribution that we are able, happy to do, because many times people treat one over F noise, frequency domain, as being something different from Raman telegraph noise. And we treat in the same uh, framework. And it's also then used for aging, for bias temperature instability. Another point that I think is very important, I will try to convince you, let's say so. <laughs> no, no, I'm not trying to convince you. I will try to comment on why statistical modeling is important. Because sometimes people invest a lot of time to get a precision, let's say, better than 10% or something like that, or get, go get 1% accuracy in your modeling. But they are talking about stochastic phenomena like charge trapping. Maybe it's not the expected value, the average value that's going to kill your application. It's the variability. And with area scaling, you actually get a very large variability. So sometimes uh, it's I would say it's important that you put effort in do proper, proper statistical modeling, that you can properly model the variability to properly evaluate what we are going to also call time-dependent variability. It's not we, time-dependent variability is a concept that is not introduced by us, but we can also see random telegraph noise uh, as, uh, as a... Um, producing uh, time-dependent variability. I think this will be will become uh, quite clear when you discuss the impact on uh, on circuits, what we mean by time-dependent variability. And at the end, I will draw a conclusion. Okay, so uh, as I saw, the, our, our modeling approach is basic on random quantities. So basically, but we assume that charge trap and detrap are stochastic events, so it's random, governed by characteristic time constants, which are uniformly distributed on a log scale. And here, when I tell you about time constant distributed over time, you could uh, also give a, maybe in the next talk, discuss the importance of the observation time window, because the amount of variability is going to depend on your observation time window, how long you observe it on the on one side and the other side, how fast you can uh, observe. I mean, how fast is your observation? So we have basically on the time scale, you have two borders. The longer one, that is how longer you are going to observe the, the circuit, the device or whatever. And the other one is how fast you can take pictures, let's say so often, not taking pictures, how fast you can do electrical measurements, okay? 
So we have a charge trap that are stochastic events and the time constants are distributed on a log scale in time. Discuss that a little bit more better later. And you have a, num a given number of traps per device, a given trap density, and the traps are assumed to be distributed according to a Poisson distribution. And also the other random variable uh, is then the amplitude contribution of the, the trap. So the current fluctuation or the voltage fluctuation, the threshold voltage fluctuation that a given trap introduces. And all these three parameters are random variables. So the time constant of a single trap is a random variable. The number of traps that you are going to get in a device is a random variable. And the amplitude of the fluctuation induced by each trap is also a random variable. So basically here is what I would like to have as a designer, what I would like to have it if I was a device engineer, a device where you have a charge that you can see as a continuum. So here we have the inversion layer, the source and the drain, and the gate that controls the amount of charge in the inversion layer. So we are assuming that you keep gate voltage constant, drain voltage constant, and source voltage constant. And you observe current over time. In the ideal case, I would expect that the current is constant over time. Since I have constant bias, I would expect constant voltage. But yes, but you know, it's not so. What, what you have? Now we are focusing only here on the inversion layer. Basically because of the, the current, it depends on the amount of charge in the inversion layer and on the mobility, on the mobility of the charge in the inversion layer. So the next slide will be focusing the herd of the MOSFET at the field effect. So with the field effect, we have that the gate voltage introduces the charge in the inversion layer. And the source and drain electrical fields moves the charge from source to drain. If you had continuous charge, you have a constant current. But you know, you, you're charge carriers are actually discrete electrons or holes. And then you may have these defects near the interface, at the interface, or into the dielectric. And then if one of these defects captures one electron, it's a localized state. So if it's captured one electron, this electron is not stay so movable anymore. So it cannot respond to the electrical field anymore. It is an unlocalized state. So we have one electron less to carry the current. One electron less to carry the current from source to drain. And all you may have is scattering this, this state here is now charged and it can scatter the electrons in the inversion layer. So the mobility also decreases. So you have lower amount of charges and lower mobility. So you get a smaller current. Here is a pictorial view. So if you have that the, this defect is empty, so it does not have captured the electron, the electron is in the inversion layer, you have a higher current. Now, if you, a charge capture, capture event happens, you get a lower current. So you see that the current switches between a higher current state and a lower current state. And from this, you can already see that you have then the amplitude contribution of the trap, this is the difference in current, and also that the times, the instants in time where the charge captured in these events happen are random. But from there, you can evaluate, you can calculate the average time the trap is occupied and the average time the trap is empty. So you can evaluate the average expected capture and emission times. So this is the random telegraph noise. So you, you have the current switching between two current states. Or you could also say that you are seeing the transistor switching between two different threshold voltage because you can translate using the transconductance, you can translate this fluctuation in current to a, trans, to a fluctuation in 
gate voltage or in threshold voltage. So you can go from what we call the output referred noise, the drain current noise, to the input referred one when you're referred as gate voltage noise. Okay, but you also have a second kind of trap. There are also some traps where the capture event is much more likely than the emission event, so that the capture time is much, much, much shorter than the emission time. That basically what you see is that the electron gets captured and you never see it being emitted. So you will have, you'll see discrete steps in steps, discrete steps in the current. So you see the current is steadily decreasing over time. The current decreases steadily decreases over time. This is then called bias temperature instability, or simply BTI. So one could say that the traps that contribute to BTI and RTM are similar. The difference between them is that the ones that uh, contribute to noise are the ones that have captured emission times that are similar. So the time between capture and emission events is similar, so it keeps capture and emitting. So it's the random telegraph noise, or you can also see it as one of F noise that we talk later. And the other kind of traps is that they capture, they capture the traps and do not emit them. They do not emit them as long as the gate bias is kept. If you turn off the transistor, if you turn off the transistor, you may see and you do see recovery because then you change the capture and emission times because the capture and emission times they are bias point dependent. So basically, you turn on the transistor, the capture time becomes shorter, you get filling the traps, and after you turn off the transistor, the emission time gets shorter and you empty the traps, emitting them. So basically, the same kind of traps, the difference is the capture and emission times between BGI and noise. Okay, and then also told you that you, uh, the random telegraph noise, discharge trapping, also produces one over F noise. How can that be? Well, here we have the picture in time domain. Time domain. So, current fluctuations over time. If you do a Fourier transform of this, you translate it from time domain to frequency domain, you'll see a Lorentzian. You see a Lorentzian here. That basically you have frequency, frequency, and here the power spectrum, the, the, the power density, the power density. So frequency and the power density. So we have more power at lower frequencies, but it's a Lorentzian. Then you see a corner frequency, and after that it starts falling with one over f square. So this decay here goes with one over f square. And if you have many traps, if you have many different traps, you have many different traps with different corner frequencies. And if these corner frequencies are uniformly distributed in the log scale, so you have, I have the frequency in the log scale, and you see here there are frequencies, a given frequency. Let's start from here. I have a given a corner at a given frequency, at a frequency 10 times higher, another corner, at another frequency, again, 10 times higher, another frequency, and so on. So I have uh, traps with characteristic time constants so that related to the capture and emission time constants are uniformly distributed in the log scale. And if they are uniformly distributed in the log scale, and you do the summation of different Lorentzians, you get 1 over f. So the contribution of different traps was time constants and uniformly distributed in the log scale yields one over f noise. If you look, if you look, you see some picture later at the at the power spectrum at the low frequency noise of a single trap, you may see Lorentzians. But if you look at the average of many small area transistors, you see one over f. Also, if you look at the low frequency noise of a large area transistor which has many traps, you also are going to see one over f. So one over f comes from the contribution of many different traps with many different time constants. Okay, so basically we have only two modeling parameters. The first one is the amplitude contribution of the traps, and the other is the number of traps. But for modeling, you're not using number of traps. 
I think this picture also shows you. Let me see. I have a measurement equipment that starts at one hertz, at, at uh, one hertz, and ends at one kilohertz. I'm gonna see three traps. Now I have a measurement equipment that may start at the millihertz range. Wow! I will see some more traps here. So the number of traps actually depends on your observation win window, either in time domain or frequency domain. So it's better that you say the number of traps per time or frequency decade. So that's end deck. But for our discussion today, it would be okay, it would be enough if you use this as the number of traps expected in a given device. Because I promise you, we will not get so much into the mathematical details because I don't want that the mathematical details uh, hinders uh, that you get the basic mechanism, the base, base let's say so, uh, insights on how uh, this may uh, uh, act in your circuit. So the basic, I want you to get the basic ideas, the basic concepts, the basic uh, mechanisms, and not necessarily the mathematics. We keep the mathematics to the minimum level needed. But some math we will need. For instance, here, because we want to Talk about area scale. So some math you do need. So basically what we say, uh, what, what, we, what we is found in the literature also, uh, is, uh, is that uh, the number of traps per device is proportional to the area. If you double the area of the device, you may expect to find the twice the number of traps. So the number, the larger the device, the larger the number of traps you expect there. And also, on the other hand, the trap impact amplitude is expected to increase with, with area scaling. So the smaller the area, the larger the impact of the trap. In a simple way, as I told you, just going to uh, uh, get the basic ideas, if you have a channel made, of, made out of, let's say, 100 electrons, and one electron is captured, you may expect a amplitude fluctuation of the order of 1%. Maybe different because it depends on where the trap is located, may depend also on the mobility fluctuations and so on. But you got the idea. Now, if you have another device that has only 10 electrons in the channel, well, I may expect a much larger amplitude fluctuation, maybe of the order of 10%. You know, so, it's more devices, you get less electrons, less charge carriers performing the current. So one electron less or more may do a larger difference. Okay, that is here. So basically one can expect that the amplitude contribution either in threshold voltage or in drain current is expected to go with one over the area. So number of traps increases in the area, amplitude frequently uh, uh, number of traps, uh, uh, sorry, number of traps increases with, with area uh, and uh, amplitude uh, fluctuation no, uh, also increases with area. So you have a larger area, you have uh, uh, the amplitude fluctuation uh, decreases with area. So the number of traps increases with area and the, um, and the amplitude fluctuation decreases with area. So larger devices have more traps but each trap has a smaller contribution. If you go to area downscale, if you go to devices with a smaller area, we expect to find fewer traps, but each trap with a larger amplitude because the amplitude contribution increases as the device area scales down. Okay, and you can see this measurement. Here's a measurement of related to, to BGI to be in the recovery, but you can see, I mean, you can clearly uh, see the amplitude contribution of uh, different traps. Here we have one, two, three, uh, four traps. And you also can see that they are distributed on different time scale. One is in milliseconds range, other is uh, a little bit about one second, is about 10 seconds, 100 seconds, and so on. So you, you can do this characterization. So it's very important also what the work what many people do, like uh, just work by the group at IMEC or other 
people that do very good work on these, on characterizing the number of traps, uh, traps distribution, and amplitude computation of the traps. And then and it's possible to measure. It's possible to, to measure uh, these uh, this and also uh, the group by people uh, in other places like the group by by uh, Reisinger are many many groups that do fantastic contributions okay but then well uh, first you would ask okay if I have with area numbers of, of traps if I go do, down with area you say okay the amplitude of the traps increases but the number of traps decreases well if you have Decreasing number of traps, but increasing area, how does the noise increase? Well, I have the amplitude, okay, the amplitude did increase, but I have less traps. So should not the noise be, well, let's say, no, no, it's not the, it's not the case. And why? Because if you have many, many traps, like hundreds of traps, some of them will be empty. And some of them will be occupied. It's very rare. It's cannot expect that a given instant of time, all traps are empty or all traps are occupied. It's like tossing coins, those and or hundreds of coins, and getting all tails or all heads. So you have something in between. So if you have a large area device, here's time, and you put threshold voltage, but that's current, you see some fluctuations. The fluctuations are related to the states of the traps. If all traps were occupied, you would have a larger VG, which relates to a lower current. If all traps were empty, you will have a lower VG, which relates to a higher current. But you have get something in between. So we get decreasing number of traps, but increasing amplitude contribution. But if you go with scaling down, now you may have, let's say, so only one trap. And then, you can easily realize the stream, the stream case. You can easily realize the stream case, the situation where you get a very large fluctuation in threshold current, current or in drain voltage, in drain current, in, thresh, in threshold voltage or drain current. Because, you know, I have only one trap. So if this trap is occupied, I get the situation all traps occupied. If this trap is empty, I get the situation, all traps is empty. So this will translate in much higher noise over time. And also here's another important concept. What is noise? Noise is related to the variance of current over time. So noise is related to the variance of a current. Here, if I do the, fu the Fourier trans transform of this, here, these black points here, I would get a low noise compared to this situation. If I do the Fourier transform of this, I will get a high noise. In this case, I even would see something similar to one or half, many traps. And here I would see a Lorentzian. A Lorentz with a large power if compared to this one. So this is another important concept. So noise is related to the variance of current over time. And here's the first key point to relate the modeling in time and frequency domain. So in frequency domain, we look at the power spectral density. In time domain, we look at the variance of current or threshold voltage over time, and they are related. They will have the same parameters, and we can even do extraction parameter extraction in one domain, frequency domain, and translate to frequency domain. I, th I think this is very important because I know many, I, I have seen a lot of data on statistical modeling of low frequency noise in frequency domain, but I've not seen so much, maybe I should look better, but I have not seen so much on modeling of the same effect in time domain. So it could be very nice if we can use if we can use all that we have learned, all the data that we have in frequency domain, to also understand and do modeling in time domain, because it's, I have heard that RTN random telegraph domain is becoming very 
relevant. And typically, when people talk about random telegraph noise, they are talking about time domain. This is another jargon. Sometimes, so you hear, you you hear here, random telegraph noise. Okay, people are referring to time domain. You hear one other noise. People are referring to frequent domain. But you can relate them. You, they are related, as I told, by this picture here. It's a very simple picture. There, of course, there's a lot of mathematics behind this, but I'm trying to get the basic ideas. Uh, that's my my goal uh, in this talk. I would be happy if I can do it. I hope you I succeed and, and we can do not get over simplistic. <laughs> okay. And here that you can also see that an histogram. If you look at the histogram of the drain current or the threshold voltage, you will plot as I mean what's the instant at each instant instant of time that you do a measurement you plot the 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 the, the value that you did measure and here the same so if you have a large area device you plot here the VT in arbitrary units you will have a very uh, close distribution with a with a very light tail that's very close distribution so don't have, don't see a large spread spread you see a very short speed. If you go to larger area devices, sorry, this is a large area device. If you go to smaller area, you have less traps, but each trap with a larger contribution. So extreme values become more likely. If you go to very small area devices, wow, you have a large speed. You don't even have, you have a an average value, so only on top is empty occupied. The average value of the VT or the current is something in between. But you see easily that you realize extreme values. So you can also see an histogram. Large area device, your VT or your current fluctuates hardly fluctuates because you know you mostly have half the traps occupied, half the trap empty, and something and some of them some fluctuations about that. If you go to smaller area devices, well, then you see a larger spread of the drain current or the threshold voltage. If you go to very small area devices, you see a very large spread. So this is basically the spread you see here or the spread you see here. Okay. So, and what's important? Important, we are, we are talking only about large and small area devices. But if you go to a small area device, it may happen that you find one device that has a few traps. More than one traps, a few traps. And some of them with a large amplitude contribution. The amplitude contribution is a random variable. But you also may be able to see a device which has maybe no visible trap in that in that time window. So you see the time window that we observe, you, you do not even see a, any single trap. Or you see one trap with a very large, very small contribution. Or you see a, a um, a, uh, only one trap by a small contribution. So these one are examples of devices of same area, same areas, very small devices. One may have very large noise and the other small one. And if you pay attention in, the, in some examples that I have of uh, frequency noise me measurement, you may see that really some small area devices show less noise than a large area device because of this kind of aspect. Okay, and then you do, you do the modeling, and basically what you see is that the expected, in, if you do it in time domain, that the expected value of the jitter, what is jitter? Jitter, what we call here jitter, for simplicity, I decided to call it jitter. Jitter is the variance of threshold voltage or drain current over time. I mean, if you, if you calculate the variance of this time series. So I have a time series and calculate the values of the time series. Okay. And okay. then the expected value of the variance or the noise, the expected value of the variance of the drain current or the noise is expected, the average value is expected to increase with area. So it's inversely proportional to area. Smaller area, larger average value. But what is even more, maybe I could say, problematic is that the Variance of the jitter, it increases with one over the area on the power three. So the variance of noise or the variance of jitter increases much faster than the expected value. I hope it may become clear in some picture I'll show, show you later on. So here is one of these pictures. Here is area. 
I go to smaller area. So these black diamonds are the expected value. And each point here is the value in one of the symbols. So here I have a many device of large area, and I have a average value and spread. And if I go to smaller area, the average value increases, but the spread around the average value increases much faster. So at the end of the day, what may kill your application is not the average value itself, but the variance, the variation about the, the expected value of the jitter, for instance, of your city. Okay, time of about time is frequency domain. This is the key. You go from you can translate from time to frequency domain. And here you see the measurement. We have some measurements. You may say that you have one device with this RTN, it translates to this one over F noise spectra. Other one has this RTN, it translates to this one one F noise spectra. And you have another device with much less noise that translates to this one ref noise. So you can do the translation from time domain to frequency domain. And you have variance, variability, both in time domain and frequency domain. Of course, it's the same. Okay. And then we have, uh, for frequency domain, we can also do the statistical modeling. And also for frequency domain, you get to the conclusion that also in frequency domain, that the average value of this, the, the average value of this the noise increases with one over area, but the variance of low frequency noise increases with the one over one over the area on power three. So of course, time domain and frequency domain are expected. If I did show you this before, it is expected that in frequency domain you will have the same. And here you can see it. Here you can see it. You have different measurements. Here is a small area device, not so small, yeah, for nowadays, has a W300 nanometers and a channel length of 40 nanometers. And a much larger one with a channel length of 16 micrometers and a channel length of 200 nanometers. And you can see here, so this is a power spectrum frequency, the power spectrum, you have a much larger spread than here. And yes, you have an increase in the average value. You have an increase in the average value, but the impact of the spread is much more significant. I mean, if I would have only a shift in the average value and no increase in the variability, I think I could say that the problem is much less pronounced. The problem is much less severe. I mean, assume you have just an increase in the average value. You don't have an increase in the variability. You would have here also a graph where all devices behave similar. I would say here devices behave much more similar than here. If the spread around the average value, the average value is around here, if the spread here will be as small as here, you will not have such a problem. Maybe I could say that. So the point is here, take care. Your variability is increasing faster than your, than your average, than your expected value. Okay. And now I uh, already saw this. You can, well, can, when you do a simulation or a circuit analysis, you should assume that you don't have a constant threshold voltage, that you have a threshold voltage that changes with time, or that you have a train current that changes with time. I mean, it either could suit that output referred, rate current, or as input referred. So you always will have a fluctuation over time. And we have a simulator, a transit simulator that can do that for you. Okay. So again, the key statistical modeling. Okay. And for doing this, also interesting is showing you here that you have the parameters that are the number of traps and the amplitude contribution, number of traps and amplitude contribution. And the same, and the same for frequency domain. Let me just so, so show you here, but go some slides forward here. And you have exactly the same for frequency domain. Yeah, I did show you already. Uh, we'll come back that. And you have exactly the same parameters for uh, frequency domain. So you have 
number of traps, number of traps, trap amplitude, number of traps, and trap amplitude in both time and frequency domain. Okay, sorry for going back. Eh? So you can then relate the variability in jitter, time domain, to the variability in frequency domain. So here we have the area of the transistor, and here again, each point here, each point here is the measurement of the noise at a given frequency. I think it was one hertz, maybe 10 hertz. I'm not sure, but is the is important here is that each point here refers to the measurement. Its blue point here, each blue point refers to the measurement of the low frequency noise at a chosen frequency. And here I have a large array device, a small array device, and a smaller array device. And you clearly see that the average value increases, but the spread increases also. So you have to, to take a look that you can translate from time domain to frequency domain. Okay. And now the area scaling of BTI. In BTI, basically you have that the, the BTI shifts depends to the amplitude, the, the average value of the amplitude contribution of a trap and the number of traps occupied at a given time. And this, at the first glance, at the first look, at the, at the first approximation, it, it, depending on the area of the device, if you keep same technology, same kind of device, it, 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 is, uh, it can be seen, it, that you have then that the expected value of the BTI depends then on, this, on the average value of a, the complete contribution of a trap on and on the expected number of traps. Well, but you know, this increases with area and this decreases. So it should, the expect the average value should be almost independent of an area. And it can be so. But the variance, no. The variance, it increases the variability, it increases with area. The variability is expected to increase with area. So this is shown here. This is the Simulation, this is simulation results, assuming that you, the trap contribution is, is uh, the same, uh, is the same for all uh, devices. So you have different, uh, sorry, you have uh, the, the trap contribution is different for all devices, and also the number of traps is different, it's random. Both number of traps and trap contribution is random. So you have here the average value and here the spread. Now I go to a smaller device, the average value keeps in first order the same, but the spread increases. Again, a smaller area device, the average value keeps similar, but the spread increases. And this again is the key. Well, don't help so much trying to evaluate average value with the precision of a few percent if you are not able to evaluate the variance because it's the variance that may kill your application at the end of the day. Okay, I'm already running out of time. Uh, and now then let's understand the impact on circuit level, on the basic of very simple logic gate. The simplest logic gate I can think about is an inverter. Well, in an inverter, you have the, the load capacitance, the capacitance at the output that's connected to the drain node. And you charge and discharge this load capacitance by the drive current of the PMOS or the NMOS. So basically you have that the drain current is going to charge and discharge this output, this load capacitance. And you know it better than me, and can calculate it better than me, better than me, that the delay of the device depends on the low capac load capacitance, depends on the capacitance, and on the drain current. So basically what you have, you have then a drain current charging or discharge the output capacitance. The larger the drain current, the faster you can charge it. The smaller the drain current, the longer it's going to take. So basically, in the first approach, you can say that your propagation delay, the delay of your inverter, depends on the capacitance multiplied by VDG. This is then capacitance versus VDG. This gives me charge. And current, you know, is columns per second charge over time. So I have a certain amount of charge that I have to put here or remove from here. And here is the charge flow. 
So basically, I can do this approximation. And well, you always say, okay, you have a constant capacitance, constant voltage, and constant current. If everything is kept constant, over all transitions of the device, I observe a uh, transition of my inverter now, or sometime later, I will always measure the same gate delay. It's going to be so. Yeah, you go know that not why because this current is not constant. If you have you have traps in your transistor, unfortunately this transistor has traps, and the number of traps and this and here let's feed only on the state of the traps because I want to focus on time dependent variability, time dependent variability. This is this, this wants to be my focus right now here on this on this picture here. So uh, you have a drain current charging or discharging the capacitor. The larger the drain current, the faster the charge or discharge. This means large current, short gate delay. Now I have the traps here and I look at this moment and all traps are empty. Large current, short gate delay. Now I look again, traps are occupied, lower current longer gate delay. So at each instant of time, my drain current is different. So each time it takes either longer or shorter to charge or discharge the capacitor. Let's say so. Here that I say, okay, uh, the logic transistor is ready when I cross it to the VDD over 2 line, when the voltage here did cross VDD over 2. So this point here. Sometimes I cross it earlier and sometimes later, depending on the current. The current is different because of trap activity. So sometimes I have a slower transition. So the inversion, the, my inverter takes longer to answer. And sometimes is, it is faster, depending on state of the traps. So my inverter, any logic gate, it doesn't behave deterministically. In a given instant of time, it may be fast, and another instant of time, it may be slower. And you may imagine this problem becomes more critical as you go to smaller areas. Because if you go to smaller areas, the amplitude contribution of a single trap is expected to increase. You know, you may have some traps that have very large contribution. Trap occupied, wow, very very low current, perhaps empty, higher current, so faster or slower transition. And this may be even more critical for the Internet of Things era. Then you have, well, you need low power. And low power may also need lower gate voltage. I have a lower gate voltage, I have less charge in the inversion layer. So less electrons in the inversion layer. For example, near threshold operation, very few charge carriers in the in the, the channel. So any electron that's trapped, captured, or emitted may make a difference. And also you have a mess there. You don't have a homogeneous cell. You have percolation paths and things like that, you know. And then also depending on, on how lucky you are or, or how unlucky you are, you may have a trap located exactly within a percolation path. And if that trap gets occupied, the drain current falls a lot, and then your gate delay increases. So that's basically the basic idea is that you will have time-dependent variability. So it's not variability related to the number of traps itself, but the activity of traps. So you may have a transistor that is at a given time fast, and at a given time is, uh, uh, slow. And if you look at, at an oscillator, in the simplest case, a ring oscillator, of course, a ring oscillator is composed of different inverters. The oscillation period is the sum of the delay of all of the stages. So if all of the stages have random, random delay, you will have also a random period. So the period of oscillation becomes a random value. Here we have the idea of this simple case here, inverter or, or a chain of inverters, a ring oscillator, but also in uh, other circuits, you may have other load that may be 
uh, a LC tank or what, whatever, you always have the basic idea of have a dry current, the drain current of a transistor, driving a load. And if the drive current varies, changes, the time, the response of the load will also change. So your oscillation period will change either if it's a simple ring oscillator or a more elaborated oscillator. Basically, the basic idea is the period of oscillation, the frequency of oscillation depends on the drive current of the transistor. The time drive current of the transistor is a random variable, random over time, introducing then jitter or phase noise. What means you will not be able to have an ideal oscillator will not be able to have an ideal oscillator because for ideal oscillator you had, would need ideal drain current and, and other things also. I mean, I'm focusing here on the drain current, it's not only the drain current that counts, other things counts also. But I mean, to get an ideal oscillator, we'll also need an ideal drain current. It doesn't have a drain, drain current, ideal drain current. So if you have a phase noise, that means that your oscillation frequency spreads, it changes over time. And in the communication channels, many want you have an oscillator that gives you the frequency of a given band in a given a given uh, synchronization frequency and you try to put them as close as possible you try to put this as close as possible divide your frequency band in channels and you want to put the channels as close as possible for that you need your oscillation period to be fixed but no you have let's say two oscillation channel one here channel two here Okay, but now this one gets traps occupied, this gets traps empty, and oh, the frequencies overlap. So you get interference, give, get overlap of frequencies. What you do, you have to keep them more apart. Okay, but kept keeping them more apart, you can use a smaller number of channels. So higher phase noise means keep channels further apart. And this leads to fewer channels in the available bandwidth, so a lower capacity of your uh, communication system. Okay. okay, and here what I did comment that's very important uh, uh, about now. Also, we are, we're going to talk about uh, parameter structure and do modeling because you know you want a good spice model, you need the parameters, and it's it's in this case you can extract the parameters either in frequency domain or in time domain. For instance, if I have, I know the device area and know the frequency and measure the average value of the noise, I can then extract this parameter here that is the expected contribution of a, the noise, of the expected amplitude, amplitude contribution of the trap and the expected number of traps. And I can do it either in frequency domain, here is SF, what means low frequency noise spectrum, or I can do it in time domain by looking at the variance of the drain current over time. I can do it in either one of them. Okay, so I can uh, go from time domain to frequency domain because the parameters are exactly the same. And if I do statistical analysis, I have not only the average value, the spectral value, but only the variance, I can do extract both parameters separately. I can either extract in a very easy way, the product of both of them, but it may be enough for some applications, or I can extract them individually. The amplitude contribution I need to on and the average value. For this, I need to know not only the expected value of the noise, but also the variance of the noise in both frequency or uh, time uh, domain. Okay, both frequency or uh, time domain. And for VTI, it is similar. If I have uh, what average BTI and uh, the variance of BTI, I can also extract the average expected number of traps that contribute to BTI and, and the amplitude contribution. And now I would like to say, uh, to talk about MOSFETs, see all the data uh, that showed was for silicon based, but you can also see random telegraph noise in many different devices, as for instance, memory store or resist, uh, resistance switching devices where you have a top electrode, contact, bottom electrode, an insulator, that is a capacitor like device, but you are going to have your current through the insulator. So these are the resistive switching devices, rerun, memory stores, and all, all in them, you can clearly see random telegraph noise. And as you could expect, you have uh, 
the, you have percolation paths, you have uh, the, the conduction uh, through the uh, insulator may, may be quite localized, and then you ha may have may see quite large, quite huge lambda thermal telegraph noise, where the conductance or the resistance of the current of the device fluctuates by orders of magnitude. So you have a lower uh, resistance state and a higher res lower resistance state and a higher resistance state or lower conductance and the higher resistance they have very large uh, difference between uh, them and uh, over time well th so the conclusion is that we have uh, time to discuss a uh, microscopic statistical modeling approach for charge tra charge trapping it has the same parameters the same phenomena in both Bias temperature instability, random telegraph noise, and one earth noise. In statistical model, model, I hope I try to show it why it's important to be statistical, uh, why it's important to account for the variability. And also the impact on circuit was uh, discussed. Very important, the work here presented is not the work due to me, but the work due to, due to many people I had, had the luck, the pleasure uh, to work with over more than 10 years, maybe 15 years, 20 years, I can't even remember. So it's a long time that I I have been involved in looking how one RF noise and random telegraph noise and DJI works. And I really like this uh, subject. And thank you so much, uh, people, uh, for the pleasure that I had working with you and learning uh, from you. It has been a pleasure for me. Okay. That's that's the that's the that's the, the end of the talk. Thank you so much and sorry for being over time. So thank you very much, Jusun, for your very nice uh, talk. So um, if uh, any one of you have uh, your questions, please do it uh, using the chat channel as soon as possible. So we have a question by Enrique Kessler. How would you model the delay variance of a combinational circuit? Assuming worst case for all logic gates seems too pessimistic and unrealistic. Yes, I, I agree with you. Doing worst case is uh, pessimistic. And yeah, I would say the, the in my opinion, the best way is do error propagation. So you calculate the sensitivities of the response of the circuit, the, the delay of in this case, the gate delay. Uh, maybe a complex logic gate to each one of the transistors in the schematic in the your circuit. So first calculate the sensitivity. And from that, if you know the standard deviation, the variance of the current or of the threshold voltage, you can calculate then from the sensitivity parameters, the response of your device. Not only the expected value, but also the variance itself. I mean, calculate, you, you have a perturbation on the drain current, or you have a perturbation on the gate, or you have a perturbation, let's think about drain current, or, uh, sorry, easier for, for the design, but to be threshold voltage. You have your circuit. Perturbate the threshold voltage of one device. See how it affects the response, for instance, the gate delay. Do it for all the transistors in, in your design. Okay. Then you have the parameters of the sensitivity matrix. And what you need to know, you need to know the variance of the threshold voltage. And then the variance of the threshold voltage is something that we can, we should be able, and be, if we are able to provide you. I mean, have to be done the characterization for a given technology. When you have the variance, the expected variance of the threshold voltage for a given technology, you have this parameter. And then you calculate for each transistor in the design the sensitivity of the response of the circuit for the variance on the threshold voltage. Then we'll have not only the average value, but also we have the variance. In the simplest case, you will need to assume that all, that all the parameters involved are distributed according to a Gaussian, according to normal distribution. In the simplest case, the, the easiest way. I don't know if this address your, your answer. I would say do sensitivity analysis. Okay, and thank it's you. the easiest way. It's the easiest way, in my opinion. And, and it, it works. <laughs> we did some 
some studies, and it seems to work. Thank you, Gilson. I'm seeing no other questions in the chat. So if you have a question, uh, you should do it uh, quickly. Uh, but I have uh, one question. So, uh, Gilson, how you see the evolution of the devices, the limits we can expect? It? Because since a long time, uh, well, each time there is a claim limit, but then uh, we always go further. No? So what is your point of view about this nowadays? Yeah, there is a very good talk by Adele Mortis-Conde about that. It's much better than me, but I will try to, to give my five cents, as people say. Well, I think uh, the major problem is that downscale transistor size, it will not bring uh, any advantage. I mean, you will get larger uh, leakage currents, but it's not good. And at the end of the day, what is going to compromise your uh, delay is also the interconnect capacitance, but do not get better. You know, so yeah, with scaling, it's very hard to get better performance, you know, more leakage and the performance does not increase because the interconnect capacitance is, a, is an issue. Another issue is that, uh, you know, doing uh, the design and the masks, uh, you know, it's getting very, very expensive. So maybe we may be going back to like something, a circuit of the shelf uh, uh, kind of design in the sense that you will have some uh, modules that, you know, it's not that you have a printed circuit board. I mean, it's, it's the same, the sense of the circuit of the shelf and have this printed circuit board and to, to put the different integrated circuits on that is being the, on, the, on an abstract way similar, but you are, putting it in the package, you know, being able to package different uh, dyes in an effective way may be what is going to bring you some advantage uh, in the future. It's a, it's a guess, you know. Uh, so packaging and interconnecting and so on, the different dyes in a 3D way, you know, that may be more important, you know, going to 3D uh, integration with different pieces of silicon, where each piece of silicon could be seen as an IP, an IP that you buy the silicon. Why? Because you know, it's becoming very expensive to do the design, the masks and so on, and to produce it. So you you, you buy the you small little dye of silicon ready, and you figure out how to package that in a, in a way that makes uh, sense. That may be what may bring some advantage in the near future. And of course, you, you also in uh, CAT, you know, CAT tools that you help you to do uh, better designs despite uh, the devices for the manufacturing level not being able to help uh, so much and use this, this kind of 3D integration. I don't know, I just, this was just a little bit of brainstorm and guessing, you know, because, you know, if I had the answer, I would get rich. <laughs> not that I intend to get rich, you know, if I know what, what was the way to go, you know, probably would get rich. <laughs> Sorry for, for this last comment, maybe it's not the best one. <laughs> okay. There is a question by William Liu. In your view, is DVT in log normal distribution or some other distribution? Or would you say figuring out exactly which distribution is not an important question? Yeah, I would say uh, either log normal with also use is exponentially distributed. Okay, uh, but they say uh, from the modeling point of view, I would say it's not that an important question from the modeling point of view. Say as long as you, as long as you know, for the technology you are doing the modeling, you know what it is. I mean, the more difficult point is no. Okay, it's exponentially distributed, it's log normal, and if you give it to me working modeling or other people that work with modeling, okay, it is exponential or it is log normal. Then people can do the modeling. Uh, the most difficult is uh, knowing what is the distribution and it may be different from different devices, maybe for different technologies, I mean. Uh, I mean, and also from our experience, it does not lead to much, to so much a different if it's log normal or, it, or if it is exponential distribution. At the end of the day, you know, the, the variance itself will be not that so uh, different. It will even 
lie uh, in uh, the accuracy of the parameter structure that you can do. I would say it's, it's not, in my opinion, it's, it's not the the key uh, the key uh, question. But of yeah, but of course it would be uh, nice. Uh, would be nice to, to to know it. So. Okay. So there's a lot of work on characterization to, to be able to answer the question. And to distinguish between of them, you have to do really a very large amount of measurements. I mean, if you do only a few measurements, you might be able to be to distinguish this log normal or uh, if it is exponentially. So you need really a lot of measurements. This is, this is very time consuming <laughs> and it's hard to get, ac to, to, to get access to this data. Thanks for the question. It's a, it's a very intriguing question. I don't have a definitive, um, definitive answer on that. Thank you very much, Jusso. Uh, I have some other few questions, but I can do to you personally in the next uh, opportunity. Okay, so thank you, no Ricardo. More, uh, I see no more questions uh, in the YouTube. So thank you very much again, Jusso, for... Uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, just to report that uh, the last question that was done by William Liu, he is from uh, ADI uh, in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very good question. Really, really, really very good question. All the questions were like two good, good questions, yes. Uh, they all, the, the one for really, from William Liu would like to to, to know exactly the answer. Sorry that I don't know. So thank you very much, Gilson.